when we're talking about uh, chemicals, we often refer to their solubility. So their solubility basically says if you take a particular chemical and you mix it with another chemical, often water, but not necessarily always water, um, you mix it with some type of solvent, is that chemical going to be soluble? Is it going to dissolve? So solubility is defined as the amount of solute that dissolves in a particular amount of solvent. Um, usually we report solubility in terms of uh, grams per 100 milliliters of solution. So in other words, it might say that the solubility of sugar is 50 grams per 100 milliliters of water. And that would tell you you can dissolve up to 50 grams of sugar in 100 milliliters of water. Um, the solubility is also dependent on temperature, which we'll talk about here in um, a little bit. But in terms of getting the uh, important definitions out of the way, a saturated solution basically contains the maximum number of grams that a solute can dissolve. And then an unsaturated solution means that you can still put more in there. All right. So saturated is the maximum, unsaturated is anything less than that in terms of the solubility. So how do we know if something is going to be soluble in a particular um, solvent? So solubility is the simple way to refer to this rule is like dissolves like. So if you have a polar solvent, which water is, water is polar, it can hydrogen bond, um, anything else that is polar or can hydrogen bond or is even ionic, right? Ionic is like an extreme type of polarity where, remember, polar bonds are sharing of electrons, where in ionic compounds, the electrons are just completely transferred. But in either way, um, ionic and polar molecules or compounds are going to be soluble in water, which is a polar solvent. Like dissolves like. And then similarly, um, in terms of the like dissolves like, if something can hydrogen bond, it's going to be soluble in water, right? Because water can form a hydrogen bond. So anything that can hydrogen bond with water is also going to be soluble with water. So the example here is ethanol. So ethanol is going to be um, a neutral molecule. It's not going to be charged, but because it has an H that's attached to the O, remember hydrogen is attached to O, N, or F can hydrogen bond. Um, it can form that hydrogen bond, and it's going to be soluble in water. Now, nonpolar compounds are going to be soluble in nonpolar solvents. So this is still like dissolves like, except now the solvent is going to be different. So octane, right, this is a component of gasoline. It only has carbons and hydrogens. And if you remember from the previous um, chapter, anytime you only have carbons and hydrogens, that means all your bonds are going to be carbon-hydrogen bonds or carbon-carbon bonds, both of which are nonpolar. So that octane is going to be a nonpolar molecule. Well, that means it's going to be soluble in nonpolar solvents. And uh, here's the example of CCl4, so carbon in the middle with four chlorines. Um, the carbon chlorine bond is actually polar, but because there's four of them, they're all pulling in equal and opposite directions. Um, that means that the overall molecule is going to be nonpolar. So octane is nonpolar. CCl4 is going to be nonpolar, so that means that they're going to be able to form a solution. In other words, you could say octane is going to be soluble in the CCl4. All right, so how do we know if something's soluble in water? Remember, we're looking for something that's polar, it can hydrogen bond, or it's even ionic. So soluble in water, yes or no? So for lithium bromide, this would be yes. And it's because it's ionic. Lithium is a metal. Bromine is a nonmetal. Metal and a nonmetal makes an ionic compound. So that's going to be a yes. CH3OH is actually methanol. And this one is going to be a yes. And the reason for this one is because it can hydrogen bond. Here's your H that's bound to O, N, or F, so it can hydrogen bond. So that's going to be a big yes. Next one is Ki, or potassium iodide. So potassium iodide is going to be soluble. The reason is, is because it's an ionic compound. Potassium is a metal. Iodine is a nonmetal. So the ionic compound here, potassium iodide, would be soluble because of that 
because it's an ionic compound. C5H12, this is pentane. So this one is going to be a big no. And the reason is, is because it's nonpolar. Right? Anything that is nonpolar, and we know it's nonpolar because there's only carbons and hydrogens around. Um, so that's going to be non-soluble in water because it's not light dissolves light. And then the last one is CCL4. This one's also going to be no, also because it's nonpolar. Um, and this is the one we looked at on the previous slide where I said, yes, the carbon-chlorine bond um, is polar. However, the overall molecule is not going to be polar because those bonds are pulling equal and opposite directions. So again, for solubility in water, you want to know whether or not it's polar or nonpolar, or if it can hydrogen bond. Okay, so when something is dissolved, right, so you take a solute and you put it into a solution, what happens is the water molecules that are going to be in there, or whatever this particular solvent is that you're using, those molecules basically surround um, the individual pieces, and we refer to that process as solvation. So when it says here, when solvation releases more energy than required to separate particles, that, that solvation is referring to the water molecules kind of surrounding um, the, sol the solute. Um, so when solvation releases more energy than is required to separate the particles, the overall process is exothermic, or heat's going to be released. So again, you have an example of sodium chloride, and you put it in water it's going to separate into Na plus and Cl minus. And then in blue, what happens is all these water molecules come in and surround these individual pieces. So those blue circles I make there are the water molecules, okay? So that's the solvation. So what it's saying here is that it's going to be exothermic if those water molecules surrounding that molecule gives off energy um, more so than it takes to separate the Na from the Cl. Um, so that would be exothermic. Now there's other cases where it takes more energy to separate the two pieces, and you don't get a whole lot of energy from the solvation. In that case, it's going to be endothermic. So there's frequent times in a chemistry lab where you kind of, um, you might have a beaker like this, Right, and you dump some chemical in there and you stir it up to get it to go into solution. And you'll notice the beaker gets really cold. And you're like, why is the beaker getting so cold? It's because of this right here. It's because it's an endothermic process. And what it's doing is it's taking energy from the beaker itself or from that surrounding area. And all that energy is going into separating the two components, whatever those two components are. Now, on a completely opposite end of the spectrum, what happens if you put a chemical into a beaker of water and you hold on to that beaker and the beaker gets really, really hot? Well, in that case, it would be an exothermic reaction and heat's going to be released because that energy of salvation is so high. All right? So those are just uh, practical examples of what we're trying to talk about here with this exothermic and endothermic uh, principles. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that temperature has a lot to do with solubility. Um, and this makes sense, right? If you're trying to, uh, an example I like to always give is McDonald's sweet tea. If you ever have McDonald's sweet tea, it's like super, super, super sweet. To the point where you almost wonder, like, how in the world do they get all that sugar into their tea? Well, the answer is they heat it. So you, if you heat your tea to basically almost boiling, you can get a lot more sugar in there. Um, and what you'll see here is there's actually a term called supersaturated. So a supersaturated solution is made whenever you dissolve a solid um, in a solvent at a high temperature and then slowly allow it to cool. You can get a supersaturated solution. And what that means is in that supersaturated solution, you have more than the predicted amount of solute that you could get in there. So um, this can happen for uh, many ionic and molecular solids. So again, as the, the solubility is going to increase with temperature. So basically, if you imagine, um, let's say you have a chemical, 
X, okay? And let's say you know that chemical X can be, is, is soluble at 10 grams in 100 milliliters, okay? So now let's look at a couple scenarios. So scenario one, here's 100 milliliters, and let's say you put um, 5 grams in there. 5 grams into 100 milliliters. So that solution there would be unsaturated. Unsaturated, because you have less than the maximum. So that's going to be unsaturated. All right. So now, let's draw another beaker. Let me draw a couple more. Okay, so the next time, I'm going to take, uh, let's take, say, 12, let's take 10 grams, and we put it in there. All right, 10 grams into 100 milliliters. Well, now, you would have a saturated solution because you have the predicted maximum. All right, so you have the predicted maximum. Now, what would happen if you took say, 15 grams and put it in to 100 milliliters. Well, what would happen here is you would actually still have a saturated solution. All right? Saturated. And you would also have, kind of at that bottom of that beaker, you would have some solid that's left behind. You would specifically have about 5 grams worth of solid that were just sitting down there and never got never went into solution. So in other words, they're going to stay as solid and they're not going to dissolve. All right? Now, what if you take that same 15 grams, add it to 100 milliliters, but you heat it. You add heat. So in this case, you do that and add heat, and then you slowly let it cool down to room temperature. Well, in this case, you might be able to form a super saturated solution. All right, so those are your two those are all your different scenarios. So in order to have a super saturated solution if you're just kind of thinking about this three, you know, in terms of your homework, in order to have a super saturated solution, it has to say that it's heated and then slowly cooled. All right? Otherwise, your only options are unsaturated or saturated. And then the last point I want to make on this slide which I've kind of made a mess of already, but I'm going to kind of point out to you down here. Um, gases are a little bit different. So the solubility of a gas decreases with increasing temperature. So that's just the opposite of what it is for solids. So for gases, and this kind of makes sense if you think about it, if you give a gas more uh, heat, more energy, the gases are going to speed up. Those particles are going to move around more. They do not want to stay trapped in a liquid. They want to fly out, out of solutions. So they can fly around in the air, right? So for gases, as you increase the temperature, the solubility actually goes down. And this is um, kind of related uh, to another more gas laws. So in the previous chapter, we talked about gas laws. So Henry's law is a different gas law, but this one has nothing to do with math. It's more of a um, understanding of how solubility works. So one, for this is this has nothing to do with Henry's law, by the way. But what we talked about on the previous slide is the higher the temperature, the lower the solubility is going to be. Right now, Henry's law says, well, what about the pressure? What happens with the pressure? How does that have an effect on solubility? Well, and Henry's law says that the higher the pressure the higher the solubility of gas um, within a solvent. In this one, the best example is a, a can of soda or a bottle of soda or however you want to think about it. Um, a soda, any type of carbonated beverage, right, has carbon dioxide inside, CO2, which is a gas. And that's what gives, you know, the soda that um, fizziness. Well, whenever you open a can of soda, it, it gives off a loud sound and it fizzes, and all that fizzing is carbon dioxide escaping and going away. And it's going out into the atmosphere because it would rather float around in the atmosphere than be trapped in the drink. So as soon as you open the can of soda, you release some of that pressure. As soon as you release that pressure from that pressurized can, the solubility goes down.
And that is something that you'll notice if you ever open up a can of soda. If you were just to open up a can of soda, um, put it on the counter and come back the next day and drink it, it doesn't taste as good, right? We say it tastes flat. Well, what it means when something is flat, it means that all the carbon dioxide has escaped or most of the carbon dioxide has escaped. And again, this is all Henry's Law.